what you're seeing on your screen is a glimpse into the future. This is four different codex agents running at the same time. All four creating various pieces of software that I've tasked them with and they have been working for quite a while. OpenAI recently introduced a new version of Codex, actually a new model. They're naming the model GPT-5 Codex. I'm not even going to touch that. It's just whatever. The way they tend to name their products after seeing it long enough, you just like, you just give up. So GPT-5 Codex is an actual model. It's now in a lot of different products like Codex CLI. So if you wanted to try it for yourself, you would copy this, go to your favorite terminal, just paste that in and run it. I already have it installed. Once you install, it logs you into your ChatGPT account and you're able to build stuff. So that's the CLI command line interface. You're able to select the model at the top. So this is a GPT-5 codex. This is kind of what that looks like. Notice it says 613,000 tokens used, 56% context left. I'll show you what it's able to do in just a second, but first it's important to understand why this is a big deal. Number one is that it's available everywhere you use Codex. You can do it for cloud tasks and code review. You can use it for local tasks via Codex CLI and any integrated developing environment. So you can use it VS Code, for example. And this is where it gets very interesting. You basically are able to move seamlessly between working hands-on on your computer. And then let's say you have to go to sleep. You seamlessly move to the cloud environment. You make some tasks that this thing can work on by itself while you sleep or you're out and about doing your business. You're still able to check in with it while it's doing those things. And it can run autonomously for a surprisingly long time. As they mentioned here, during testing, we've seen GPT-5 Codex work independently for more than seven hours at a time on large, complex tasks. It's rating on its implementation, fixing test failures, and ultimately delivering a successful implementation. While I haven't been able to get anywhere near close to seven hours of, of work time on this thing in one fell swoop, I do believe that that's possible. This thing can work for a long time. So here, for example, is Codex in the cloud. So like the, the web version of it. So as you can see here, it ran for 11 minutes working on a project, added close to a thousand lines, created the PR, and I was able to take that pull request and merge it with the repository. Keep in mind, I'm not a developer. I've worked with code here and there. I've been doing a lot of stuff online, but I never had a full-time job as a developer. I never put in my 10,000 hours. So it does seem like a lot of this stuff is getting a lot more accessible to people that are not necessarily full-time developers. Rune, a member of the OpenAI team, is saying right now is a time where takeoff looks the most rapid to insiders. We don't program anymore. We just yell at codex agents but may look slow to everyone else as the general chatbot medium saturates. Looks like a GPT-5 codex is already 40% of the traffic for codex. People seem to be loving this. And it seems like they figured out how to do reinforcement learning for these agents to do these coding tasks a lot smarter. Here's a graph, it might look a little confusing at first, but Noam Brown at OpenAI, I think, explains it pretty well. He's saying that GPT-5 Codex is 10x faster for the easiest queries and will think twice as long for the hardest queries that benefit most from most compute. So it tends to think a lot more about the more complicated ones, much more so than the previous model. So it, it allocates more thinking to problems that deserve to be thought about more and it thinks less about the simple problems. In this lower 10th percentile, 94% almost less tokens than the previous model, GPT-5 medium. As we covered before, there seems to be a very big trend of people moving over from cloud code to codex, from Anthropic to OpenAI, based on just some of the recent comments that I've been seeing, and this thing has been out for less than 24 hours, keep that in mind, but it seems like a lot of people are going to be moving over to Codex. This is where it gets interesting. So with Codex, you can use images to share front-end design specs or explain UI bugs, right? So you take a screenshot and you're like, make it look like this. Or if you have a design where something's broken, you just circle and go fix this. Remember those aliens in Star Trek that would kidnap like the really smart people from other ships and then you just tell it, it is broken. Can you make our ship go? Those are sort of the extent of their capabilities that they would just point to things and go, it's broken, 
make it go. Or as Rune puts it, we don't program anymore, we just yell at codex agents. Now, different coding models had that feature for a while, that's not super new. But now we're beginning to see models develop these uh, skills that I've been really looking forward to and talking about. And that is the ability to actually go and do its own troubleshooting by using a browser, by using vision. Here they say, as it builds for you, Codex can spin up its own browser, look at what it built, iterate and attach a screenshot of the result to the task and GitHub PR. And here's an example of that. This is a kind of a cloud task that this agent is doing. And I think the big point is that we're slowly beginning to enter this agentic era where we delegate tasks. It goes off and does it on its own. And as far as I can tell, it's getting fairly accurate at these more long horizon tasks. So let me show you a few things that I've built. Keep in mind, I've only had not, not that many hours to play around with it. This thing has been out for less than 24 hours. I probably had a few hours to mess with it as well as some AFK time as I was working in the cloud, but I feel like I just scratched the surface of what this thing can do. I'm really hoping to see that somebody with a truly Harry project will kind of unleash this thing on it and, and see where it takes them so it can really put this to the test. So here's just a few examples of what I've been doing with it. Keep in mind, it's not a true test. I need to come up with something that's a lot more challenging and a lot more complex to really test this thing out. So these were just the first few test projects that I came up with off the top of my head to test this thing out. Let's take a look. So really fast, let me show you how to run it. I am on Windows. No, I don't know why. If you're on a Linux or a Mac, good for you. But on Windows, we'll say a CD for change directory. All my stuff is in code slash codex. So we'll go there. We'll do mkdir, make a directory. We'll call it Flappy Bird. We'll go into that directory, enter, and then we'll run codex by typing codex. So as you can see here, it shows you what directory you're in, what model you're running. That's a GPT-5 codex. So that's the star of the day, right? You can change the model by doing slash model slash init to create an agents.md file with instructions for codex. This is a very important. One of the upgrades of this model is it's able to follow those directions a lot better. So if you're working on a important project, that's probably the first place to start. We'll cover that in detail in a later video. Now I'll usually start with approvals which allows us to set what this thing can do and what it should not do. So by default, it starts in read only, so it can't really do anything. Auto means it can do all this stuff, but it will verify everything with you. And full access is you're just telling it to, to go for it. Use that only at your own risk, but we'll start there. If you do slash model, you can choose the reasoning and the model. Now, the only thing I could not get it to do is to create a flappy bird clone where you control the flapping of the bird by using your hands in front of your webcam. That was the only thing it couldn't do on GPT-5 Codex Medium. So let me go to high and try again. Create a flappy bird game where you flap your hands in front of the webcam to control the bird and then you click enter and away it goes. So we'll leave it alone while we check out what else it has built. So first things first, I wanted to see if it can build a little website app for me where it would modulate my voice when I used my hands in front of the webcam. Again, I like that test because it utilizes a lot of different sort of things that have to plug in and work together. There's video, there's audio, there's hand recognition, right? It has to track where your fingers are in front of the camera. It has to do some sort of an audio modulation. So there's, there's a lot of stuff that goes into that. And it has to build it into a easy to use web format. It took a couple of tries, mainly because the audio wasn't coming out, but everything else was working flawlessly from the first shot. Let's take a look. So here's what that website looks like. As you can see here, it's requesting to use my Razer Keo Pro Ultra and the microphone, whatever microphone I want to use. So, so far, everything's working really, really well. I do have to stop this stream in order to connect. So, all right, let's test this thing out. So, 
With my left hand, I am able to control the pitch. So let's see how my voice sounds when the pitch is all the way up here, or what it sounds like when we bring it down all the way down here. How does it sound with pitch at negative eight, negative nine, negative nine, there we go. On the other side, we have wet. Now, I think for that to, to work, you do have to have pitch as well. So if we raise the wet level, this is what that looks like. This is the wet level high. And here we have our wet level low, wet level low. By the way, if you've been enjoying this channel, please do me a huge, huge, huge favor. Make, Make sure you subscribe and, and hit the like button. button. That, that helps a lot. A lot. So I gotta say, that's a pretty big leap forward. Not that many months ago, this would not have been impossible for a LLM, for a coding agent, to have done with just one prompt. And if it couldn't one shot it, then, you know, telling it to try again would rarely work out. Now, with these more advanced agents, once they know what the issue is, they keep working until they fix it. It's pretty impressive. There's a lot of moving pieces here and it nails it flawlessly. The wet and dry right handed sometimes clipped in and out, but you can use your hands to modulate the voice how you want it to, which is pretty cool. Next, I wanted to see if it could create a cool 90s video game theme website that was selling super intelligence. I wanted some game like backgrounds where there were ships floating around. Oof, it just blew that one up where there were missiles flying towards it and some sort of counters and stuff like that that would show how many people are signing up every second to take advantage of this, these massive massive deals it's a fully functional website clicking different buttons takes you to where you're supposed to go well i should say we we don't have the checkout process yet but the sort of the front end all of that stuff is working we have some testimonials of course 100 percent made up and generated by ai really good call to actions, lots of, you know, numbers to make it look very, very realistic, frequently aligned questions. That's interesting. And believe it or not, we have working privacy pages and all of that stuff, security and careers. You can send in your mission brief. I just noticed that even made up an email address. Don't email that email address. I don't know who that is, but this was a piece of cake. So I just need something much, much more difficult. That's what I'm planning to do for my next round of testing. Something with a lot more functionality and just a bunch of different stuff that we're going to test out to see if we can stump this model in terms of its ability to do web development. So far, I mean, this is great. Again, a little bit too easy. Now, if you've been paying attention to what's happening in the YouTube land, you've probably seen a lot of uh, creators are saying that their views are down. It's 100% has something to do with automated traffic. It's not anything seasonal. But in this Linus Tech Tips clip, they created a little bit of software that helped them analyze what was happening. A little piece of software is probably a better way of saying that. So this gentleman who I think is their engineer slash tech support guy created this. What this does is basically it pulls the data from YouTube from whatever channel you want and it shows the view to like ratio. Basically, it seems like somewhere around August 13th, I think is when everything started kind of uh, taking place. YouTube figured out how to filter a bunch of traffic out. So the real humans stayed behind and a lot of the automated traffic was cut out. And you can see that because the like to view ratio kind of went through the roof, meaning that the number of likes stayed consistent, but you know, the views dropped. So the ratio increased, by the way, please hit a like if you're a real human being that's really helping out right now, please do me a favor, hit like, show me that you're not a dirty botter, please. But the point is they use this tool to analyze several other channels and lay it out in the graph like that. I wanted to see if Codex could create something similar for me. So I asked it to build something that uses the YouTube API to pull data from YouTube from whatever channels I choose and figure out what the likes to views ratio is. Here's what it came up with. So for example, if I put in the channel ID of Sabina Hassenfelder, it would look something like this. So there it is. Let me just expand it here. So as you can see here, it's got like 5%, 6%, 7% alike to view ratio. Here's the same thing for tech linked. So again, similar numbers, everything's looking good. 
It also creates a PNG of the graph. So you can take a look at it and that automatically saves it to that folder. So again, it's pretty nifty what you can do with it. And it's pretty good at completing those tasks. Again, it's very cool, but we're going to hit it a lot harder next time. I promise. Next, I tested it to see if we could use the OpenAI API to create a voice assistant. Here's kind of what that looked like. Press enter to speak. What day is it? Today is October 3rd, 2023. Need help with anything else? So that's pretty good. You hit enter to record your voice. It transcribes it and the assistant responds with the voice. Again, it's somewhat simple, but in the past, we've had a lot of these coding agents fail a task like this because you have API, you have sound, you have a lot of different packages that need to be installed, etc. Here it did struggle with the voice a little bit, so it was very easy for it to actually hook up to the OpenAI API, but the voice output took a few iterations, but eventually it nailed it. And finally, here's our flappy bird. As you can see here, it has a tracking motions. At first, I thought you were supposed to do this and that didn't work. Apparently, you're supposed to really swing your hand. Let's see if I can, there you go. So basically, when you swing your hand, the bird flaps its wings. It's surprisingly difficult, and I gotta say, it's a, a, a bit of a workout. I mean, for someone that spends most of their day behind a computer, it's a bit of a workout, I should say. But it nailed it. Again, it's a leap forward from the previous models. Oh boy, I started it again. But I still need to do some more difficult and challenging tasks for this model. So. All in all, I am very impressed so far just with my early testing. Very excited because I feel like I found a new toy. There's tons of things to explore here. The ability to jump between, you know, terminal ID, web, even your phone, as they say, that seems like a big deal. You can be getting stuff done asynchronously away from your computer, checking in with your phone. This feels like a pretty big leap forward. Now, I'm still not sure if this is going to mean that everybody is going to be using it to develop serious software. There's just been a handful of people on YouTube that are developers that have tested out. So far, it seems very, very promising. So I'll leave it up to them to tell us how good this is on actual enterprise serious projects. But where this is 100% going to be a game changer is, for example, for people that are thinking about doing a startup with their own app. They need a simple prototype. Back in the days, it might have been difficult to create. Let's say somebody has some knowledge in a specific area. They want to create an app to utilize that knowledge, but they don't have a coding background. In the past, they either had to shell out a lot of money for a developer to develop it, or maybe they had to raise some money to make it a startup, or they had to partner with a tech founder, or potentially spend a lot of time learning how to do it themselves, that has changed. Now it's getting very easy to start creating your own software, especially if it's a simple app, you just need a prototype to give to your friends to start testing it to see if there's any market traction that road from zero to one, it just got a whole lot easier that opens up the creativity to basically the entire world. Anybody with an idea can develop it fairly quickly and fairly easily with not a lot of money invested. I mean, if you get the pro plan, that's 200 a month and just spend the, the entire month just ranking it out, you can probably launch it for $200. So more in-depth testing coming soon. But as of right now, from where I'm sitting, this thing feels extremely exciting. If you made it this far, please hit the thumbs up button to prove you're human and I'll see you in the next one.